Okay, everyone. Well, thanks for joining uh, the Hyperledger Denver Meetup Group today for an exciting presentation. And today I'm very pleased to have Alfonso Gavella from Hyperledger Latino America presenting along with his mentee, Amit. And uh, the presentation today is going to be all about global scouting for DLT blockchain educational opportunities. And then uh, we're going to also have uh, Bobby from the Hyperledger Learning Materials Working Group go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit more about what Alfonso has going on as well. But I also wanted to just reflect on a few things. One, for those who were able to join us from the last meeting with Firefly, that was really an exceptional session that was put on by Nico and uh, we really got a lot out of it. Anyone who's interested in joining that community, it's in the Hyperledger Labs and it's really ramped up recently. I went ahead and posted in the chat there about uh, Firefly and I welcome everyone to join the community calls that are coming up. If anyone has any interest in that, uh, feel free to reach out to me after we wrap up this session and I'll make sure that you get involved with that. The other thing I wanted to mention is I've been uh, collaborating with Bobby and also Jim Mason around the blockchain employment series. And so the first event that we had in Denver was fantastic. We had a great attendance, some wonderful speakers. And then uh, Bobby and Jim just wrapped up the event with Hyperledger Boston. And then the next event that we're going to have is going to be with Hyperledger Princeton. And Bobby's going to be the host for that. And maybe Bobby can also talk a little bit about that during this session here. And then uh, we're going to finally have a blockchain job fair. So anyone looking to get into the blockchain space or build up their skill set, please join us for that fourth event, with it, which is going to be the blockchain job fair. So uh, I've worked with Alfonso on a number of items. We had a great event at the Hyperledger Global Forum, and I'm really pleased to be able to have him come back and join us for this presentation. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby to do a little more introduction about Alfonso and also to talk about the Hyperledger Learning Materials Working Group. So Bobby, I'm gonna turn it over to you for that introduction. After we wrap up, please feel free to post your Q&A and I'll make sure that gets addressed. Okay, so thank you, John, and thank you for working with me on the BC Employ. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alfonso today. He is my co-chair um, with the Hyperledger Learning Materials Working Group, um, and it is a pleasure working with him. So I'm just gonna go over a few items first and then turn it over to Alfonso and his mentee, Amit. So let's go first with um, housekeeping. Um, again, this is a Linux Foundation sponsored call. So that's the antitrust policy. Please take a moment to read it over. There's also a link to the code of conduct, which is just how to act on calls. So I'll leave that up on the screen for a minute. Okay, so again, we're at Hyperledger meetups and basically those are uh, groups that get together like-minded people who want to discuss and play with and create with blockchain. Um, so Hyperledger sponsors them. Again, it gives us the recording, the YouTube channel and great resources. There's meetups all over the world. So if you're not a part of a meetup in Hyperledger, please go to meetups and type in Hyperledger and join your local meetup. Um, so also at Hyperledger, there's special interest groups and working groups. So I'm not going to go too much into these, but here is a list of what they are. It's where, again, like-minded people, consortium-based um, information gets traded, um, you know, focused on a specific area. So again, there's um, climate action. That's a very active group. Uh, Capital markets is an active group. Um, and then there's working groups that specifically target a technology like smart contracts or learning materials. Um, and again, if you want to join one of these calls on the homepage of Hyperledger Wiki, there's a calendar of public meetings. If you click on um, at every group and every project, host a biweekly meeting. So you just have to find the group you're interested in, find their biweekly meeting and join it. They're open to the public and they encourage people to just go introduce themselves and say, hey, I'm interested in this. I would like to um, 
uh, do that. Is there a trouble with my screen share? Nope, your screen share looks great, Bobby. It's just coming through with the Hyperledger calendar and Perfect. the link to the URL. Okay, so next, why we're here is the Learning Materials Working Group. Again, I had mentioned that Alfonso and I co-chair this. We run this um, informational group that gathers all the documentation from the community and the best practices from the communities. We have templates, we have recordings, we have a lot of information. Um, just go to our homepage. We do a bi-weekly call where the beginning of the call, we introduce newcomers to the Hyperledger community. Um, and the technical steering committee recommends that all newcomers go through the learning materials working group kind of hyperledger training. Um, but we are sponsoring two mentorship programs this year. Um, one Alfonso will talk to you about and the other very quickly I'm going to mention is the learning materials um, giving chain project. Um, and that is the project that we're doing at the end of the summer um, mentorship through the learning materials working group where we're running three supply chain um, aid projects. Um, and those are the three projects. Um, if you want more information, our meeting is Friday the 13th. Uh, and there's a link to it. <laughs> so the other mentorship program that I wanted to talk about, or that we're talking about is the Global Scouting. And I'm gonna turn the screen share over to Alfonso. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you very much, uh, Bobby. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, I can't. Can you see my screen? Not yet, Alfonso, but I know we tested it right before the event, so. There it is. Can you? Yep, looks good. Just, I would just go into present mode. Okay. How about it? Perfect. Good. Well, this is the global scouting of DLT and blockchain educational opportunity. It's a mentorship project at the, of the Linux Foundation at the Learning Materials and Development Working Group. And we are now, Amit Chaldari and, and myself, uh, we had uh, Shen Ming Yang, but I'll tell you later, he had a wow. car accident and is not uh, at this project, but he's recovering. Uh, and we hope he recovers uh, fully and, and well. Learning about blockchain and DLT is difficult. There are overwhelming amounts of unstructured information scattered across the web. We waste plenty of effort in isolated searches for golden nuggets, but we can hone our skills faster with proper guidance, and we can build together a collective body of knowledge. What and where to learn, where to gather dispersed data, what structure to add to understand the content, how to expose it for public benefit, what learning path to follow, how to align our skills with labor markets, how to support our entrepreneurial spirit, at what cost. Is financing available and inclusive? Are there scholarship? Mass collaboration can answer this question faster. Paraphrasing Linus law, given enough eyes, the ocean of educational opportunities, it's shallow. We want to engage and energize an active community of learners, self-selected by their interest, assisted by a communication mechanism and an open source toolkit. This effort to me reminds me of stargazing. For millennia, we have looked at the sky, try to understand, again, scattered information, vast universe, no structure whatsoever. What did we do? We built instruments. We built instruments that allowed us to register the movement of the stars across the space of the celestial sky. 
But what really helped us, what really helped us, because it went beyond the technical instruments to the everyday people in the fields and in the streets was the notion of constellations. We were able to detect patterns in the stars. And then we added to those patterns a cultural meaningful notion, the notion of a mythical figure, okay? And that notion helped people remember the pattern, help people see the pattern, but see it in a context. And that context was given, not only by the geometry of the pattern, but by the content of the mythological figure. With those patterns, we advance from recognizing the zodiac, the constellations, to abstract representations and to actual cartography. What's our plan? It's similar. It's similar, but today. We want to gather a community of blockchain DLT gangsters. And we want to, in this community, we want to gather four kind of people, four roles. We want to gather learners, educators, curators, and maintainers. We all love to consult, understand, absorb, ask questions. We like to facilitate, to teach, to tutor, to mentor. We like to oversee collections, select themes, create content, find, filter. We also like to inspect, preserve, repair, communicate, and be proactive. But also, we want to be recognized with what we do. We're thinking to have now badges, badges at our learning materials and development working group for learners, educators, curators, and maintainers. And in the near future, given the fact that we're part of Hyperledger, okay, we want to have tokens. We have to have learning tokens, at least for two immediate purposes. One is as you collect tokens from the activities that you do with this learning initiative, you're building a profile and that profile can be quite useful for employers to look at and help you being selected. The other issue is that once you have a reputation earned and backed up by tokens, maybe, maybe, but I do hope we can do it. Maybe we can go to the learning institutions and trade those tokens for scholarships. The cost of certification, it's slow for the US, but for the rest of the world, I can tell you from Latin America, it is expensive. It is something that it's a barrier. So batches and tokens, that's how we want to reward our community roles. This community would gather information in two ways, in a human and in an automated fashion. In the human uh, gathering, we did a very small survey and we want your help to expand the reach of this survey. The survey was translated to 10 languages. And after the first two traditional name and email, we have six questions, it's very simple six questions. What is your occupation? What field of interest? What experience you have with blockchain? What level of expertise you think you have? What are the learning sources you know or you have used? Your willingness to continue working in this community, whether you would like to chat, talk, communicate with others. And last, what have been the difficulties, the hurdles that you have faced? We translated 
to Chinese, to Hindi, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, Arabic, Japanese, and Russian. We're still missing Indonesia. That's the only translation we couldn't do. When we have that translation, we'll have the five continents of the globe. So we sent this with the help of Hyperledger. We've had just the beginning of the responses. Not too many, but enough. We want your help to reach as many Hyperledger meetup groups and blockchain communities that we may know of. What did we find from the beginning of the responses? First, that we're still working with English and Spanish. The other languages, the regions of those other languages have not reached yet. Then only 44, but it's about half, have had an experience with blockchain. And the experience is on the lower side, okay? People with initial experience are the people that are approaching us for learning resources. What are the learning resources that they have recommended? Mainly platforms, YouTube and internet. Three quarters of the total learn and internet. These are the platforms that they wrote in the answers. Some small numbers work with chats, with books, with universities, or follow a specific uh, guru that knows about the field. The interesting thing on the lower right hand is that 100% of all respondents want to be involved and want to continue in this trip. Now, this is the survey we ask your help to reach as many as we can. What are we doing with the automation? Well, with the automation, we want to enumerate digital resources with two instruments, a taxonomy and the web crawler. The taxonomy is a conceptual map, a conceptual map for the initial zodiac of our constellations. I know it's impossible to read. Okay, so I'll go very fast towards the structure. Basically, it has seven branches. It talks about places of learning, it talks about levels and types of education, skills and competencies of education, fields of learning, learning resources, evaluation, and it points the way to use cases. We haven't developed use cases yet. And so if we go, I'm gonna go very fast because uh, you, you'll be able to, to have the presentation and look in detail. We'll go to the detail places of learning, as we saw, their learning platforms, universities, academies, what happened. You know, the skills, uh, the education level and types, we're using standards as much as possible from other people that have worked in, in the field. And there's a paragraph with the credits for you to, to read. In this case, it's uh, that comes from uh, UNESCO International Standard of Levels, Levels of Learning. We also have skills. We also have jobs that are being defined and accepted in, in the industry. And this relate to VC employee that, that uh, Bobby would tell you about uh, uh, quite soon. But also paths of learning. Everyone expressed in the questionnaire the need to, to be guided in a path, in a path of learning, where to start, what to follow, where to go, okay? Learning resources, there are courses, labs, seminars, and tutorials. But if we go to the right side, the right side is for the fields of learning. And we are working with two uh, taxonomies. One is the DLT system anatomy that was presented in the Global Forum at, in Basel in uh, 2018, I remember. So for instance, you have the protocol layer, the network layer, and the data layer. Each of those uh, subdivide for you know, 
components, communication, transactions, operations, and each of those in themselves have further fields of, of knowledge. This is the anatomy of, of the LT. If we go to blockchain, the taxonomy, the credit is down, down below. The taxonomy also relates to consensus, transaction capability, security and privacy, identity management, native currencies and tokens, uh, rewarding systems, extensibility, what have you. But as we proceed and develop the branches and the nodes of this taxonomy, we are describing the fields of education for DLT and for blockchain. Also, we have names to build this to uh, broad categorizations. We need a hardware and infrastructure layer. We need a data layer, network layer, consensus layer, application and presentation, business model and entrepreneurship. So we have on the left side, the structure of learning. And on the right side, we have the fields of learning. At the center, we can evaluate. We can evaluate standards in general, places of learning, learning resources, skill acquisition, and certificates. So taxonomy is our conceptual framework for cognitive searches. We can get any of these nodes and ask a query to the crawler so that we get a response that is structured within a conceptual framework. Framework for concepts and cognitive search. Okay. Now, once we have these two results from human and machine gathering, then the community will validate. The community will validate and filter, but it's an ontology, a structured view of the world for the field of DLT and blockchain learning. And that ontology would be represented in a graph database that has a vehicle, the knowledge graph, to traverse that universe. Um, Shen Mingyang was the mentee, and we have to give credit to him, that suggested working with knowledge graphs from the very interview that I had with all potential mentees at the beginning of this project. And he said, we have to go the way of a knowledge graph. And he did, with his help, he began this initial uh, structure, okay, where he had seven courses, three places of learning, four fields, levels, relationships, what have you. Unfortunately, at the middle of July, he had a car accident has to be at the hospital, he's recovering, and we hope he does recover fully and quickly. But he had to step out of, of the project. We're giving him the recognition he deserves here. Amit was kind enough and a strong team member. And I said, I'll take, I'll take uh, Shen Ming's uh, side also. And he works now also the knowledge graph. And this is what uh, Amit built. This is all the nodes. These are all the nodes of the taxonomy, but expressed as an ontology, as a relationship between different fields. If you zoom in, okay, for instance, these are the jobs, okay? These are the jobs that are defined. Um, and Bobby presented them in, in the first session of BC Employee. And here they are, included in the ontology, in the conceptual framework. If you look on the other side on a more theoretical aspect or research, if you want, or just to know what learning is about, this would be the side of the consensus map for blockchain in, in general. I know you cannot read the details, but it is in the presentation. So we have five steps, the community, survey, automation, validation, and knowledge graph. But this 
five steps are cycles that repeat over and over. Okay. We want the cycles to run as many times as possible and or as needed for us to evolve in the recognition of patterns in the universe of blockchain and TLC educational opportunities. For instance, we ran a web query of just three nodes, places of learning, learning platforms, edX. And this is what we got, okay? And this is what edX has for the courses. We transformed the taxonomy. And as you can see on the lower part, you can see, but you cannot read, okay? Uh, you have the 21 courses that appeared in that search, but structured, structured within learning resources. And eventually this list of learning resources would grow, 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 grow. And at the upper top, on the left, you have the places of learning and the type of learning. And on the right, you would always have for each course, you know, the map of the anatomy of PLT and blockchain. So the courses of FedEx become organized in the database. Well, and we define, selected, distilled from the info, the properties that are shared by all the courses. And it's with, they're written on, on the right. Beyond the name, the URL, and the place of learning is the cost, the structures, what it includes, hours of course material, weeks of online courses, months where access is available to, to the online, the rating, if it has it, or the rating that the community might, might assign or help us assign from, from the user's experience. The experience level that you need to have in order to, to better profit from the course. Who is it for? What would you learn? What would it prepare you for? The outline syllabus or whatever format each, each course decides to represent its contents, the prerequisites and the learning paths where that course belong to. So Amit would explain to you now the, the technical details for making a better sense of graph. Amit, I'll uh, give the microphone to you. Hello everyone, I'm Amit and I've been a mentee at Hyperledger from the mentorship program for this year and it's been an absolutely awesome working experience till now. I'm supposed to explain the technical details about the project, so let's go. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see what is a graph. Before we start to understand how a knowledge graph is made, we need to first understand what a knowledge graph is. Uh, the knowledge graph at the end of the day is a graph and a graph is an abstract data structure in terms of computer science while working with them is difficult at times the explanation for a graph is pretty straightforward it's a collection of nodes and links nodes are the resource points and the links are the relationship describers between nodes basically nodes and relations come together to form a graph uh, the background of this slide as you can see is the knowledge graph that we currently have uh, available it contains roughly 300 nodes and a lot more relationships. Relationships from this point onwards, I'll try to address them as links. So whenever I say links, it means relationship, relationship between two nodes. Um, on the next slide, I'll try to go into more detail into what is a node and what is a link. Um, the easiest way for me to define nodes and links is to give an example and explain that example. I like to use this uh, example of a father and daughter relationship example. How would a person try to model the data between a father and a daughter in a graph database? The father and daughter would be two nodes and these two nodes would have their node properties. For example, name, age, education, profession, other human qualities as properties and links would be relationships. For example, a daughter D would have the relationship of his daughter with father F and the father would have the relation of his father with the daughter D and this would have its relationship uh, 
detailed inside the links and then going forward you could also define what a link property should be so for example the relation property would have qualities such as love compassion and other human emotions um, go, moving forward onto the next slide we once we have all of this data and modeled into a graph we need some way to visualize it and as you can see on the left this is one of the most common and the most easiest types of graph visualization methods it simply shows nodes or circles and the relationship between them as the line connecting these circles it can be a line it can be an arrow depending upon the nature of the relationship and this is more, one of the most intuitive visualizations in my opinion but i'm also exploring other types of visualizations on the background the main aim of this project was to create a virtual place where the whole blockchain community can interact with this knowledge graph that we are creating and we need a place to host this graph safely so that every person can benefit from them uh, the simplest and the most straightforward way i have come to conclusion along with the team is to host a website uh, now let's talk about the choice of hosting that website in the next slide in which we'll discuss the stack choice so we've gone with neo4j as the backend database where everything will be modeled stored and curated and we are using nextjs for the business logic and the front end the client side things uh, both of them have amazing advantages which i'll go over right now so neo4j is a graph database it's tailored for specific use cases exactly like knowledge database and it has a very free data modeling system you don't need to uh, first define a schema you can do everything and change everything on the fly although there are some restrictions but it's pretty free in terms of data modeling and this will come in handy when you have very different nodes and there's also this cipher query language which is used to uh, query the whole database and it's very easy and intuitive when working with graphs to use neo4j and apart from this one of the biggest advantages for developers who are going to be working on this it's that it has excellent documentation support right now um, for the next js one of the main biggest reasons that i've chosen next js is for server side rendering ssr it has many benefits like data security it has reduced page load times you can predict performance beforehand you can have fewer com cross compatibility issues between browsers so we can ensure a lot of audience does not face any problems when they visit the website and apart from this there's also this main big advantage that it's very popular within the javascript community and the front end community and this also has a great documentation support which translates into an awesome developer experience as you can see that little yellow guy over there are the developers like me who are going to have an awesome time working with this technologies both of these technologies currently have a fairly low barrier to entry and are extremely easy to get started with this will help later on in the project phase where we have to maintain the project i really do hope that people come from this talks and would like to contribute to this project in terms of development and the data curation aspect i personally i'd be really happy to work with you guys and girls uh, where are we now so on the next slide we'll see where are we currently in terms of development progress right now what we have currently is a populated and a deployed neo4j database currently we have also defined a skeletal structure for the knowledge graph and i have also gone ahead and started to implement a force directed visualization for the knowledge graph it's the earlier example of visualization that i showed the main aspects that i want to work going forward are interactivity in terms of adding features that safeguard the database so that no one can just come and drop the whole database or things like that you don't want the whole database to be uh, completely curatable for everybody else so that's the reason why we have created four roles and have authorization in that aspect we are working on it and going forward i have also plans for internationalization accessibility and much more the problems that i expect to solve in the next slide are um, the interactivity and the data curation workflow streamlining so when it comes to interactivity with the knowledge graph currently what we do is interact with the whole knowledge graph in terms of cipher query language we have to write queries in order to get certain nodes and the relationships between them and fiddle with queries in order to interact with the whole database which is not something that a normal user is expected to do and 
I want to make it so that every user, regardless of they even know Neo4j, like you might not know Neo4j and you'll still be able to interact with the database and play with it and learn from it. This includes features and implementing these kinds of features which will promote interactivity and open up the database to more and more audience. A good example of a feature like this would be a search bar or a form or a or a piece of text to fill out for node informations. And I'm open to suggestions if you have any extra interactivity features that you'd like to tell me. As for the data curation workflow streamlining, what we are going to do, what we are currently doing is that uh, input all the information that we are able to gather in a Excel sheet and then have that Excel sheet be uh, parsed and converted into a bunch of queries and we run those queries and then the knowledge database gets created. Uh, but going forward, I'd also like to streamline that. And these are the current two problems that I'm facing, but there will be and there might be other problems going ahead, but we'll face them. And these are the ones that we are currently focusing on. So. That's it for the technical slides. If anyone has any questions, I'm ready to take them after the uh, whole presentation is done. I'll now let Alfonso speak. Thank you, Amit. So our plan again, community survey, automation, community knowledge graph over and over again. What we will achieve, a thriving community, diverse and interested in learning resources, a knowledge graph to help navigate our ontology and a global directory with learning resources. What's our call to action? Please help us expand the reach of the survey. Answer the survey, please. And afterwards, contribute to ontology and taxonomy. Contribute to the continuous development of our knowledge graph and help us create the results. If we do this, you would be finding in those knowledge graphs your own constellations. You would be defining, your searches would become constellations, mythical constellations. And the sum of all of your constellations would be our cartography, our cartography of the universe of blockchain and DLT education opportunities. These are the links to our project page, to our working group, and the survey, which is the entry point, the entry point for our community and our two uh, personal coordinates. Thank you very much, uh, John, Bobby, and all of you for your kind attention. And let's go to Q&A. Yeah, that was a perfect presentation, Alfonso and Amit. I really appreciate it. And the thing I would like to do is, Amit, in that presentation, or Alfonso, there were a couple other links for the Learning Materials Working Group and for the project. And if you could maybe just post those into the chat, that would be super helpful to the group. And then the other thing that I would recommend to everyone who's joined the call today is, Go ahead and open up the link that Bobby had provided earlier around the survey and please do take that survey in the language of choice that you want. And the more data that we can capture by the survey, the better off we're able to support this project. So I'm gonna see if there's specific questions coming from the chat. Otherwise I have quite a number of questions to ask uh, the team here. So one of the things that I was really excited to see is really you know, reaching out to the global community, Alfonso and Amit, and having the survey available in so many languages really was a win. And I would say anyone on this call, if there's additional languages that you'd like to see added to the survey, or if they would wanna even help with, I think you had mentioned Indonesian as a language that you're looking to have uh, made a part of the survey, they can definitely you know, reach out to either you or a meet and I'm sure you'd be able to update that survey based on that feedback. Okay, so I'm receiving responses for Korean. So I'd add that. Yep, Korean, perfect. And that's the wonderful thing about the Hyperledger community and the Learning Materials Working Group and the great work that you know, both Alfonso and Bobby has led the way in 
is really you know, bringing on these additional languages and making sure that all of the Hyperledger content is available to the international community in their language of choice. So, uh, please, please leave it in the chat. Yeah, good. A way to, to connect for, for all the languages yes. or suggestions. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you want, you could write a mail to me and Alfonso. I'll give you the links. One other thing that you brought up, Alfonso, in your presentation that I think was very relevant is you know, allowing international diversity and inclusion by talking about the tokens and talking about the badges in the learning materials working group. And I would definitely like to hear much more about that because I'll give you this example. I know that the edX classes are free generally, but when we look at the global spectrum and you talk about the cost outside of the US, we wanna make sure that those are available to everyone. And by having, you know, let's say a token economy or badges available, it might be a way to really support the international community by being able to use those type of devices to, you know, pay for the real certification that comes if you decide to, to do that. So I guess I'll turn it over to both Alfonso and Bobby to talk a little bit about that. Well, the idea comes from the issue of inclusion. Okay, we've been trying to include as many people as possible. We are an open source community. So and an open source that's interested in disintermediation of trust. Okay, in two words, that's what the whole blockchain DLT is about, to disintermediate trust. And to do that, we cannot impose a language or restrict an economic level of, of access. So language is a way to include, but finance is also a way to include. And I can see it here in, in, in Yucatan where I live or in many places um, as a UN uh, consultant, I've seen it in, in Africa and in India, in, in all the, the, what's now politically correctly called the global south, when I was younger, it was called the developing countries, okay? Um, so the global south, what is an economic fee for the US of $200? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, not only for students, but also for professions, okay? $200 is a well-paid monthly salary in Yucatan, a month, okay? So besides eating, who's gonna pay for it? So if part of this project is to facilitate the engagement of everyone, a multiple eyes to look, why don't we reward the vision of those eyes? And why don't we use those rewards for the same teachers and learning platforms to know that they are being promoted, uh, used in the best sense of the world, you know, and, and ask them for scholarships mm -hmm. or have, have employers look at profiles. I mean, your profile would be your wallet, your learning, materials and development token, how much of those tokens you have in your account, in your wallet, that's your profile for an employer. Bobby, I, I see I see you. <laughs> I actually have a question. So if sure. I'm a learning facility and I um, have filled out your survey, but now am overhauling my classes because in blockchain, you have to do that every 20 minutes. Um, how do I get that information to, um, do I retake the survey or do I, like, how do I update the, my information? The, the survey is just the entry point, Bobby. We are going to have a series of interactions, okay? There would be a way for everyone. The survey is, if you enter the survey, 
we know that you are interested, okay? We have 70 something people interested. So that's our initial community. But for instance, we already have a knowledge graph and a taxonomy to share with those 70. So we have to send them that information. Once we have the, the website, it would be displayed there, okay? But then we would have another ways of how do you add a node? How did you change the taxonomy? Do you want to prune a branch? Do you want to grow a branch? Do you want to, you know, take a fruit from that uh, end node? Okay, so there has to be more, more ways of interaction. Remember, this is just a three month project. Okay, we have two months and, uh, and less than, than one more uh, to go. What do we want to have? We want to have enough interest in the hyperledger community for this project to continue, okay? And in the continuation of the next phases of this project, answer what you're asking and a much more questions that would definitely arise from, from the community. And that's what we want. We want queries, questions, uh, contestants, we, we, but because we have now the tools to, to manage and integrate the, the knowledge that comes from that debate. Thank you. And thank you for this hard work. It's unbelievable what you guys have accomplished in two months. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, I'll second that for sure. I think Amit and uh, Alfonso, you've done a wonderful job on this project. And what I really want to ask the community here is how can they help you to continue the great work here? Are there avenues for them to connect with you that are going to be better? Or what do you need from a resources standpoint to really to make this flourish? First, answer the survey. We'll get you registered as an interested member of the community. Then we'll communicate while the, the website is, is built, okay, we'll communicate through emails. But once we have the, the website ready, that was where the interactions uh, that Amit was explaining to you, that's what the interactions would be. What are we asking you to help us with? Survey, answer the survey, enter the community, and be aware that will allow you, will ask you to contribute to the taxonomy and the ontology and the knowledge graph. Okay. Okay, I would like to also, uh, Alfonso and Amit, talk a little bit about this mentor menteeship and how successful that's been, how you've you know, felt about the program and you know, the opportunities associated with Hyperledger mentorships. I'll let Amit answer that. Frankly, I'm too happy, been... but maybe he's the one that's that's been suffering. <laughs> no, no, that's not the case at all. Um, it's been a great learning opportunity. I've been um, I've been working a bit for the last few weeks, but that's aside. Um, this is because I want to get the website up and running by the mid of this month, and we are part way there, and just a bit more. So. Yeah, it's been a big learning opportunity and I'm really glad I came to know about this whole opportunity and this whole community that's inside. From like my personal, my previous experience has been uh, completely towards the front end application and JavaScript development community. And this is something that I've just gotten into because of this mentorship program. And it's been a, it's been a big pleasure working with Alfonso um, being a part of learning material group and everything. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, and, that is awesome. And I uh, think, you know, a uh, lot excuse, of- the, Excuse the, me, John. Yep. Excuse, excuse me for interrupting, but uh, I also want to recognize Shen Ming. Okay. Huh? Shen Ming was with us six weeks of the 12. Okay. And uh, he was also awesome. You know, when we had, we asked for two, 
because we thought it was a big project. We didn't realize how big it was, you know, and how big it is. But um, I want to recognize his contribution, you know, and I want to tell him through this channel that we all wish him to recover fully as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I know Alfonso from talking to you how much effort he put forth on the project and it's just one of those challenges of life that he's dealing with now. But let's definitely recognize that contribution and hopefully he has a speedy recovery and can get back and engaged in the project. Something that I'd like to say is that if you're a developer who has earlier worked with Neo4j or Next.js, either of them, please do get in touch with me. I've dropped my mail in the chat. I'd like to have a chat with you. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. And I think one of the things I was just going to mention, uh, Alfonso, was just the international collaboration that I see occurring in Hyperledger is really great to see. And maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. You know, since we've been dealing with a lot of these virtual events, I've felt great international collaboration. But even from your perspective, Alfonso, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, global mentorship, because I think that's a huge win for Hyperledger. Um, yes, I think the, the pandemic and the lockdown really unlocked us, okay. It gave us uh, not only a way, but also a wish to connect, okay? And at least uh, from our side, we've seen this as an opportunity to get out of the lockdown much more deeply connected. It's the deep connections that matter, okay? We do miss and we do need the human physical connection. That's a given, okay. But the virtual connection, for instance, for Latin America, it allowed 10 meetup groups from nine countries yep. to come together into the form of a chapter. And that was at the time where, when David Boswell and the Hyperledger community was recognizing mm -hmm. the convenience and the importance of regional chapters. What happens in regions is like in Latin America, we are all like cousins, even though in Mexico, we call the you Americans cousins. Okay. Um, you know, the cousins to towards Latin America, it's like going to a, uh, the house of, of aunts and aunts, you know, uncles and, and aunts. Um, they are familiar, but they're different. Okay. They're similar if they have the, the family culture. But each house is, is, is a world in itself. But so the importance of differences and similarities create a synergy that is extremely powerful. And that's what chapters do help with, okay? We put together the Latin America uh, chapter and immediately the first thing was that there are so many people you wouldn't believe, regardless of, of high social economic levels, that do not speak English. A well, few of us have been fortunate to, to study in the States, okay? And to go to the movies and not having to read the subtitles, but just enjoying, you know, the, the, the natural speech of, of actresses and actors. Um, most of the people have to read. Okay, and a lot of the movies now are being dubbed into Spanish for a very sad reason. Children do not read, so they cannot follow the, the subtitles. So the first thing uh, we did at the Latin American chapter was to have the first free um, Spanish course of hyperledger fabric. Okay, and it was a big success. We had uh, 1,500 attendees, okay. It, could, it can be improved, of course, it could be better, of course, okay. But we saw the importance of, of, of the language. Um, I began, began to, to contact uh, the other groups in Hyperledger. It's not only Spanish, but there are nine languages, uh, 10 languages that are being uh, curated by different groups. 
uh, Chinese is an amazing group. And they have a standard army, I call it, of 200 translators, okay? And they've been doing it for two years, translating the hyperledger uh, fabric documentation into, into uh, Chinese. Um, that is, that's another work. And it's all related to inclusion. It's inclusion of, of similar diversity of finding barriers that have to be lower, uh, finding uh, fences that have to be open, okay? In terms of language, in terms of, of finance, okay? I mean, we cannot be talking about a tokenized economy, uh, not only decentralized, but disintermediated, um, while, you know, concentrating resources one way or another. So that's, that's why um, I'm, I'm passionate about that inclusive aspect. Um, Janet has a really nice question here. She says, I'm curious about the usability for the general public. Amit mentioned a translation between Excel and Hyperledger. Can you explain on that? So uh, there was a slide where I was talking about the data curation workflow that we have currently. And a big part of it is that we first input all the information in an Excel file, then grab the CSV from that, and then use a very simple program to convert all the uh, rows and columns into a uh, query format and that query format is in cipher query language and once i feed that to the terminal it gets converted into the actual knowledge graph the end goal is to be able to at least be able to show off that knowledge graph on a particular website and that is the website i'm currently working on and part of it is done but as soon as i have the crucial main uh, pieces of interactivity added, I'll be uh, deploying that website as soon as possible. That's a nice question. That's exactly what I'm working on right now. So that the general public, regardless of whether they know all of this stuff regarding Neo4j or Next.js or everything else, they should be able to interact with the knowledge graph and be able to learn. How can you expect someone who's already not a specialized person in a particular Neo4j to be able to learn and catch up on blockchain? That's, that's, that's not how things work. It should be that it's very easy to use and it does not require any prior experience so that you can learn and interact with the database. So yeah, I'm working on that right now and hopefully it's done by the mid of this month. Not a block though. So she asks again, if I understand you correctly, you are changing the Excel to a database and then to a blockchain. Um, no, the taxonomy is about DLT and blockchain related stuff to be fairly inclusive of everything else. What we're trying to do is convert the Excel CSV files into nodes and try to establish relationship between the nodes ourselves. So when you say that you're converting Excel to a database, what we're basically doing is converting Excel files into part graph database. And then we are completing that graph database by defining the individual uh, linkages and the relationships ourselves. So that's what we are doing. We are yeah, defining the nodes and then we are defining the links right now. Uh, Janet, it's a taxonomy is a conceptual framework. Okay. And that's why it's been represented as a mind map. Okay. It's just a series of concepts that are relevant to understanding a field of knowledge. And they are structured as a tree, but they are concepts. It's a conceptual framework. And that tree can be represented graphically as you saw it in, in, in the screen, but also it can be represented as, as a file. And represented as a file, it has been stored in, in Excel, but then, you can turn that file into a knowledge graph, a knowledge database where the concepts not only exist, but you can specify relationships between concepts. So the tree are all the issues. The tree is just a classification. The knowledge graph 
adds relationships to those nodes. And you can add as many relations as you wish, as the community wish. And so that it's what's called the ontology. That's the general understanding, common understanding for consensus of what the field is about. Okay. Eventually we'll have, you know, uh, direct applications in, in blockchain. Uh, the tokens would be one of that. In, uh, the, the profiles would be one of that. You know, the participation in the, for the roles in the community. But taxonomy and knowledge graph are two conceptual instruments. They are like the observatories that I showed at the beginning, um, you know, in Egypt, Stonehenge, India, you know, and Italian telescopes. There are instruments, but they're also constellation. It's just a collective imagination, putting some content on top of the stars. Of course, there's not a, a, a Taurus uh, zodiac sign. I'm Taurus, by the way. I was born in May, okay, on the 19th. Then comes Gemini. Okay. That, that doesn't exist, you know? but it's there. It allows me to see the V of Taurus in, in the sky. So it's something we add in our collective minds to structure that constellation of, of a scattered information in the web. Otherwise, if you want to learn, you have to be on your own. You have to be alone. You cannot have the help of others. And you do searching for nuggets, for golden nuggets. No. How do you compare if your nuggets are big or small? No. How do you know if you're digging for the right metal conceptually? Okay. So we are many steps before writing a natural blockchain uh, system. We are structuring a way for a community to structure knowledge. So it's meta, meta work. Yeah. It's foundational work. And we're just, you know, even before mining, we're just, you know, looking for where to, to, to gather the stones to build a Stonehenge. And they are as weight, as weighty as, as those. Perfect. Alfonso, you'd be thanks for that uh, wonderful uh, wrap up there. We're now at the top of the hour. So we should bring this to a close. Uh, any final comments, Alfonso or Amit, before we wrap up? Uh, thank you very I much. I just want to say something. I'd yeah, like to say Amit? something. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you could get in touch with me through mail and um, I'll be like, glad to explain everything to you. If that's okay. That's all. Me, me too. <laughs> me too. Perfect. And then uh, I'll also say to Bobby, you want to just mention the next employment session that's coming up for Princeton? That would be great to hear as well. Myself, let me unmute myself. Okay, so the next session, um, let me see, um, is the Princeton session, and that's going to be on um, August 12th, Thursday night. Um, and then it's followed by the job fair on August 24th. Um, these are the gentlemen, along with myself, that are putting this on. And the first one was John's at Denver, and we discussed blockchain jobs that are available. The next one, and educational um, paths that will get you to those jobs. Then we also, uh, the next one, we discussed from corporations like Google what they want in employees. And the Princeton one, is, oh, we talked about your hiring plan. Um, what that looks like. Um, and then the last one, actually, I'm going to stop my share. The, the next one is the Princeton. And again, that's going to be about marketing yourself, what it's like to brand yourself. Do you need a LinkedIn? What does your resume look like? What skills and qualities are people looking for? And I believe John's going to be on my panel for that one. Um, and other, um, I think he has some um, other companies coming. So please join us for the next one on Thursday and next Thursday. And then the wrap up will be again at the end of August with a big job fair. Thank you. Okay, everyone have a wonderful day and thanks for joining this great session. Take care.